Um, I'm actually uh, uh, representing Bonnie Glazer here. She's stuck on a metro um, between West Falls Church and Farragut West. Uh, she will arrive when she arrives, but she asked me to not delay the proceedings on her account. Um, this gives me an opportunity to uh, uh, thank her profusely for all she did and her staff did to make this event possible. Uh, we are really pleased uh, to partner with her on this occasion. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, we're going to have a really uh, great event. Uh, I'm pleased that so many of you could come on such a nasty day. I'm particularly glad to see my former colleague, Barbara Schrage, Managing Director of the American Institute in Taiwan. Um, the program uh, you have before you, um, uh, three panels, uh, a luncheon talk by yours truly. Um, and uh, we're particularly pleased to have uh, so many uh, outstanding uh, scholars from Taiwan to uh, help us understand uh, Saturday's election and what it means for a variety of different issues. Uh, we're also pleased to have uh, one of uh, the People's Republic of China's uh, most outstanding scholars of international relations, Chu Shulong, my former colleague. Um, so, uh, since we have so much talent uh, on tap, uh, I think we should get going, and I'd like to uh, turn the proceedings over to Ed McCord. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if a, his two remaining panelists have arrived, but they're staying in the neighborhood, so they should show up uh, pretty soon. Ed? Well, I hope some of you are, are awake. I know a lot of us were in Taiwan and we're all a little jet lagged, and so I expect to see yawns today, but that's okay. You know, we'll understand why you're yawning. Um, our, panel our panel this morning is, is uh, titled Analysis of the Presidential and Legislative Election, so it's a very broad title. And I think, uh, as we expected in this, in this election as well, you saw the same kind of major themes that always happen in Taiwan elections. Uh, this time there was uh, some attempted emphasis on, on domestic issues, economic issues, and uh, government efficiency issues, mainly by the DPP and by, uh, by James Song. Um, then there's the perennial uh, identity issues, much, much less in force, it seemed to me, this time than in previous elections. And then finally, of course, cross-strait relations, which always can overwhelm everything else. So those are the three kind of themes I thought really did uh, 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 provide kind of stability in, in terms of election to election. Uh, but we also th saw procedural things like charges of corruption or charges and counter charges of corruption or, or government mismanagement or uh, dirty tricks, things like this. And then, of course, there's also the element of external forces. Um, uh, influence of the United States, influence of the PRC. So those are, those are what I feel kind of the broad issues in, in, the, uh, in the elections. But what I was hoping, of course, is to hear from our very expert panelists today to kind of straighten out what was really most important among that possible spread, uh, spread of issues. And so we're gonna, since our other two people aren't here, we're going to reverse our, our uh, order of people. And we're going to start out <coughs> with David Fell, who's the senior lecturer in Taiwan Studies from the Department of Political and International Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. He's also the Deputy Director of, of SOAS Center for Taiwan Studies. Uh, he's the coordinator of the European Association of, of Taiwan Studies. He's written a number of books on Taiwan. Most recently, it was Government and Politics in Taiwan, which came out in, in 2011. So without further ado, I'll turn the podium over to uh, David Fell. Right. Thanks very much. It's it's uh, it's it's uh, great to be back in in Washington. I was just um, here uh, about a month ago, looking ahead and making some predictions on on the uh, on the election. So it's it's um, it's nice to kind of come back and see what I got wrong or what I got 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 right. Um, because I, I do I don't have the uh, the best record in the world for actually predicting uh, Taiwanese elections. I've been very fortunate to have to have been. Uh, in Taiwan for, for most of the major elections over the last um, uh, 20 plus years, going back to, to the late 1980s. And each election has its unique features. For, uh, from my perspective, perhaps the most unique feature of um, uh, this election campaign has been the uh, merging um, of the uh, presidential and parliamentary uh, elections, the first time this has ever uh, happened. And one of the most interesting things for us political scientists in this election has been the interrelationship between the two uh, campaigns. 
Now, merging these two elections together um, has had its uh, positive and, and negative sides. Um, one of the, um, uh, the, the stated uh, motivation for, for merging these two elections, of course, was, was saving um, campaign spending. And I think, to an extent, uh, to a certain extent, that has actually been, been true. Um, and, and also another positive uh, aspect has been improved parliamentary uh, voter turnout, which um, in, the, in recent years, there's been a decline in parliamentary voter turnout. Uh, but there have been some, some, some negative implications for merging these two elections. To a large extent, the parliamentary election uh, has been overshadowed by the, uh, the uh, uh, presidential campaign, at least until the, the, uh, the final month of the campaign. Um, Taiwan's uh, legislative uh, UN is an extremely powerful uh, body, but it's also an extremely unpopular institution. If you look at public opinion surveys, um, you find that voters have extremely low trust in uh, legislators and political parties. And, uh, and that has meant that this election, uh, in this election, uh, the uh, parliament hasn't received the democratic scrutiny that it, it deserves. Of course, saving money was just the um, uh, stated reason for merging these two elections. In reality, both parties were motivated by um, partisan advantage. The KMT's hope was that um, incumbent KMT legislators would help the uh, campaign of a relatively unpopular presidential candidate. Uh, in contrast, the DBP's hope was that a um, strong DBP presidential campaign would help a large number of new parliamentary candidates. Um, now, if you look in detail, I think we find that both were right. Um, but it varies geographically in terms of the uh, interrelationship. Overall, it would appear to me that the DBP benefited more than the KMT by this, this merging. Um, and I think the KMT would have actually done better if the two had been uh, split. Now, one of the things that I've been uh, particularly focusing on in, in uh, looking at in in this campaign has been the parliamentary election. And, and hopefully that means that uh, we w I won't be overlapping too much with the, uh, the other two speakers. Um, one of the things that I've been arguing repeatedly, both in my writings and in, in, in talks in, over the last um, couple of years, has been uh, the importance of Taiwan's uh, parliament. In many ways, I would argue that the parliamentary election was, was actually more important than the presidential one. But of course, um, in terms of media coverage, that hasn't been the case. If we think about the uh, Chen Shui Bian era, one of the key lessons, as I've mentioned uh, in my last talk in Washington, was that um, essentially, without parliamentary control, presidents are extremely constrained in Taiwan. Uh, that meant that even if Tsai Ing-wen had won this election, I think she would have been uh, forced to moderate her position without control of the, a parliamentary majority. So to, to a certain extent, uh, the KMT's terror message, the idea that uh, Tsai's election would have meant a um, um, ruining of cross-strait relations, or economic relations, um, was a bit of an exaggeration, because Tsai would have been extremely constrained. Overall, if we look at the uh, parliamentary um, results, we can see that the system still favours uh, the KMT. Um, but I think there have been some positive trends in this election, particularly the increase in political diversity, the, uh, the fact that third parties have actually uh, received uh, seats. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Overall, um, this parliamentary election was a disappointment to the DPP. Essentially, the DPP managed to win back seats that uh, it should have won back in 2008. There were a few surprises uh, in the results, places like Ponghu, which were won by the DPP for the first time. Uh, but the DPP also had some major setbacks. Uh, and of course, the DPP also lost some seats that it had won in by-elections. Um, although the DPP only won uh, 40 seats uh, on this occasion, uh, it could have won uh, quite a lot more. And, and indeed, um, some predictions were talking about the DPP winning 50% uh, or even a parliamentary majority. One political scientist um, uh, in Taipei was predicting a possible DPP uh, majority. Um, and here it just would have required a quite 
um, um, quite a small vote swing for the DPP to have done far better um, because it lost narrowly in about, about six seats. Uh, so it just needed a small uh, swing here. If we, if we think back to this, this first Mainjo term, um, the KMT lost quite a large number of seats as a result of vote buying cases. Um, this means that if we see a similar kind of trend, then this, the KMT's narrow majority could actually be um, uh, eroded and become a um, less workable majority. So I think to a large extent, my show is going to be constrained in the, uh, the parliament, despite his um, seemingly working majority. Now, why didn't the DVP do as well as, as people like myself and others had been predicting? Um, I think the DPP did make some strategic mistakes in this uh, campaign. Um, some of these are, I think, are focused on this campaign, but some of them are quite long-term mistakes. I think one of them in particular, uh, that I've been qu quite critical of the DPP over the last um, uh, decade or so, has been that it's tended to put too much focus on um, presidential campaigning and not enough on um, the, uh, the parliament. And I think we can see this um, in this election. Um, in this election, I think it's also made some errors in terms of its nomination. Uh, in other words, it had too many inexperienced candidates um, in um, parliamentary uh, district races. Um, and I think this, and uh, it also had many very strong candidates in its party list that could have won, or at least been more effective at the district level. I think the um, best example of this is the DVP's nomination in Taipei City, where most of the DVP's um, uh, candidates were quite young and, uh, and less, in, in, less experienced, and up against very strong KMT candidates. Now, one of the things that I think we found as uh, election observers this time um, is the question of how are the parties going to cope with defeat? Now, one conclusion that we, we, we came, came to was that defeat would have been far more um, damaging for the KMT. The, K the KMT has been over-reliant on Mindjo um, for the last decade or so. And I think the, the KMT would really have struggled with losing the presidential election. It would have gone through a very serious uh, power struggle. For the, for the DVP, which has, is the losing party on this occasion, uh, we have the question of whether Tsai Ing-wen can actually uh, survive as party leader and potentially presidential candidate in 2016. Um, when, when we asked the question about who would be a potential successor to Tsai Ing-wen if she, she doesn't continue to stand. Um, it was quite disappointing to hear a number of, of, of old names, people like Su Zhen Tsang. Um, nevertheless, if we look at the way Taiwan's political parties have coped with defeat or learned lessons of defeat, um, I think I would argue that the DPP has been much more successful at dealing with defeat in, in, and recovering from defeat. Uh, we see this in the way it recovered from setbacks in the 1990s and the way that it's, uh, within only a couple of years, it recovered from the quite disastrous elections of 2008. In contrast, the KMT tends to be much slower at responding to defeat. And we saw that in the way it responded to defeat in 2000 and also in, in 2004. It took the, two, the KMT um, almost five years to really become electable again after the 2000 defeat. Now, parties don't always learn the, uh, uh, the right lessons of defeat. Um, and in many ways, um, observing this election reminds me a lot of the uh, British uh, pr uh, general election of 1992, when many observers expected Labour to, to come back to power. But at the last moment, voters opted for the, the safe option. After Labour lost in 1992, it, it went through very, very um, uh, comprehensive reforms and made it uh, electable. And this is the kind of lesson that the, uh, uh, the DVP needs to go through on this occasion. 
It needs to look at how it can expand its uh, base, how it can win floating voters, swing voters. And it's going to need to look for a, a really convincing new vision. And I think it needs to look again at its uh, cross-strait policy. Now, overall, I think um, there's been some positive trends in this election. Um, one of them I'm particularly pleased with is seeing an increasing political diversity, particularly in the, uh, the parliament. The fact that we see seats um, won by the Taiwan Solidarity Union and also the People's First Party, I think, is a very a positive sign. Even the Green Party um, was able to reach a uh, record vote share and actually become the fifth largest party in terms of vote share in Taiwan, exceeding the, uh, uh, the former important party, the New Party. Um, I think it was also good to see the parliament become much more balanced. The um, election in 2008 um, saw the KMT getting almost three quarters of the seats. Um, which made Taiwan look almost semi-authoritarian uh, in some respects. So I think this new balance, I think, is a, a very positive sign. Of course, disproportionality is still a problem in the Taiwanese political system with the, this kind of single-member district electoral system. But again, I think it was positive to see that following the election, again, there was some discussion of electoral reform of the, uh, the parliamentary system. Whether or not it can really happen is another uh, big question. Um, so overall, despite some kind of worrying signs, for example, in terms of external pressure on uh, Taiwanese voters, I think there's a lot of uh, positive signs. Um, and I think the increased diversity and increased balance, I think, um, make Taiwan's democracy look much more optimistic um, than in the last four years. So we have our full panel now, so we'll go back to our original order. Um, our second presenter is Antonio Zhang, a journalist and a publisher. He was very active in the Dong Wai uh, democracy movement in the early years. He, found, he was the co-founder of the New Journalist magazine, editor-in-chief of Taiwan Daily News, founder of the Taipei Times. He also received a master's in political science from uh, uh, National Junction Dashia and served as a deputy Sec secretary general of National Security Council from 2000 to 2004. Um, he remains today a political, a political commentator and a columnist and a senior fellow for the Institute for National Policy Research in Taiwan. So with those credentials, I'm very, looking forward very much to hearing from him. Good morning. Thank you. I'm very sorry to, to keep waiting, I mean, to come to lay here. Uh, first of all, I have to thank uh, CASIS and Brookings for the invitations. Um, but I think the, the topic today is uh, rather easy for us, because uh, I, I will hope if DPP win, we're more exciting. <laughs> and if we have uh, uh, first female president, we have a lot to talk. But now it seems uh, back to the business as usual, so <laughs> everybody become a, could be very wise to, to explain what's happening in Taiwan. A lot of people are uh, disheartened, a lot of people are overjoyed by the result. Um, for people like me, I, I am not so surprised because I saw so many elections in the past, more than 30, 30 years, constant elections. So I have I confidence that the voter will have uh, placed a kind of invisible hand, try to balance, uh, compensate. Uh, they always compensate the defeat with some, some reward. And uh, they teach some lesson for the winner. For the past, we have already done more than four times of presidential election. So this is the fifth time. Um, I think uh, most of the people were agreed this is the first, the best election, presidential election we, have, we ever have. 
in terms of the electoral culture, ele election, uh, 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 I mean, uh, culture, the improvement of uh, uh, the platform, I mean, uh, the vote buy-in. There, nobody really talk about vote buy-in. And uh, nobody talk about unification uh, or or uh, independence. And uh, the ethical mainland Taiwanese issue is gone. And also, uh, uh, very uh, nobody talk about the history of Taiwanese history. Uh, so it seems that the uh, the whole uh, the page is turned over. You know. It's maybe because uh, we have the best uh, candidate from both party, Ma and and uh, Tsai Ing Wen. Their personality, their style, their uh, their background is very different from a traditional uh, uh, politician. So that's I have to give them the credit for improving the uh, the the. I mean, the, no 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 much. Uh, negative campaign when you compare U.S. election. <laughs> okay. And uh, best, best of all, we have no bullet, no magic bullet this time. So uh, everything seems uh, runs very smoothly and professionally. Uh, the big, the ready, the uh, machine, the uh, advertisement is very uh, professional. I think we have enough know-how to export to people maybe in the Middle East. <laughs> I remember uh, the, the eve before the voting, we uh, met with a lot of uh, uh, Chinese uh, reporter and writer from China and Hong Kong. This time they have more than, as I, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I, need, I know they have more than 2,000 people from mainland China observing uh, this election. And uh, I'm lucky to have a lot to, to meet with the very famous uh, writers, poet, poet and uh, a reporter from China. And they are so excited. The first uh, weakness, they witnessed this uh, uh, democracy in action. They went to the headquarters of KMT uh, to see how uh, Ma Anjo make a speech. And then they moved, they all went to Ban Chao to, to see uh, how, uh, what happened in, in uh, Tsai ing -wen's last, uh, last night, last evening, I mean, the, the biggest ready. And they are so excited. And everybody uh, uh, come to the conclusion that there's no way for Main to, to win because <laughs> it's no comparison. I mean, the emotional enthusiasm emotional reaction from a big ready. Tsai ing is a big ready is emotionally, very big crowd and uh, enthusiasm. That's very lacking in the uh, mind Joe's. And they come to, uh, we have a very, uh, very happy uh, uh, a snack, uh, nice snack, until three o'clock in the morning. Everybody gets drunk. <laughs> and they say, oh, Tsai ing win, win. I say, no, no, come on, come on. I, I no. <laughs> uh, I very. Uh, I said uh, you cannot judge uh, from the uh, from the, uh, the, the 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 number of the uh, of the, the scene of the ready because KMD used to be more emotional, more and the, and the voter in K, in DPP is more enthusiastic. KMD is very different, so we cannot judge by the result from the the ready. So I, I just cool them down, but everybody get drunk. And then they are so excited, they are so happy, and then they became so sad. They said, oh, come on, we can never have that kind of uh, election in China. So, and uh, this time it's not the prop, not, uh, the question, uh, the, the election. Uh, for me, I, I don't surprise uh, that uh, Mao win. Uh, uh, because I, from the beginning, I believe Ma will win by a small margin. I believe that the, is no, the political atmosphere is not ready for, uh, for DBP to get power, to, to get the power a bet. I think Ma, 
Tsai Ing-wen still have the last mile to, to cross. That last mile can be a very long mile. To, uh, so the, 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 the issue here is now uh, why DPP lost? The, the issue is uh, why Ma ying campaign so hard, so difficult. He enjoyed such a perfect, more than any political leader enjoy, uh, uh, three quarter of majority, and perfect ruling. I mean, uh, and uh, and uh, he had the whole support of the business community, and endorsement from Washington D.C. and the whole support, more than more than support, more than moral support from Beijing. <laughs> he had all the good condition, as we Chinese said, and yet he campaigned so difficult, the campaign is so difficult. In the time, in the last uh, stage, he almost lost the election. The anxiety and tension in, in the blue Blue team is so obvious, so overwhelming. That's why in the last stage, they play that kind of crisis car. Everybody feels a crisis. If Ma Injo lose, it's devastating for KMT. And some people think also straight relations. So this time, people wonder why, uh, how, Mind you, is a decent man. How he lost that kind of mandate for the past more than three years, and the DPP didn't do much to improve. Tsai Ing-wen didn't say much. She had not enough charisma. He didn't do much to prove her leadership yet. Yet she almost make. I mean, she almost defeat uh, Mind you, according to the poll in the all the time, I mean, uh, especially the last months, the KMD almost lose the election uh, from every poll. There is a small, very small margin. It's a, uh, uh, so people wonder why is a lot of people thinking that uh, DPP are going to win. But uh, then most many people think why the piggy bank can defeat 92 consensus. <laughs> and uh, they almost defeated 92 consensus, the only through a piggy bank. And, uh, but uh, I think so we have to critic Jin uh, Xiaodao, uh, switch bread, Jin. He, I think he have uh, come up with a very skillful uh, uh, strategy. Uh, and uh, the main reason for Ma to win the comfortable majority is because uh, the, uh, this the issue a state, the state of, is the, about stability and change. And people vote for stability instead of change because uh, uh, Tsai Ing-wen is now uh, is untested. And uh, because uh, if Tsai Ing-wen, Tsai Ing-wen, they are so much unpredictable. I mean, people worry, they have no trust. And also because during campaign, TPP try to avoid uh, the substantial, I mean, the issue. Uh, uh, the, 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 the party platform from DPP is rather uh, vague, uh, evasive, uh, and uh, some slogan is uh, rather slogan, and the slogan is empty, empty. So I, I even uh, DPP, a lot of people from DPP think Tsai Wen will have a soft landing. She will cope with the, the crisis after she get elected with very skillful, uh, 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 I mean, uh, way. Uh, to, to calm down the, the tension, but in the end, people vote for stability. This election, as a friend from Mr. Fair mentioned, I think I'm so glad that I speak after him. 
he gave a lot of uh, comprehensive analysis, given all the facts. Uh, the, the, the LOI is more, very important, and it's, uh, this result of the LOI is a bit more healthy, new balance. Uh, the KMT, even KMT win the election, but actually he, KMT lose many votes, many seats, uh, and TP increase uh, to a more healthy mid, uh, opposition, uh, uh, I mean, seat, uh, strength. KMD is uh, from 81 seats to become uh, 64. And TDP from 27 now increased to 40s. So, in fact, the TPP has increased on the rise, and TB, uh, KMD is declining. Uh, that's more healthy because that bad come back to the basic structure of the society. And also the presidential election. The KMT, the Ma Angel, from last time 56% to now 51%. They done great. I mean, they lose 5%. And DBP is increasing 3%. So DBP is on the rise. The general trend is DBP on the rise. And, uh, and uh, KMT is uh, going down. But that's uh, is a no, uh, no surprise because uh, I think that will be uh, more healthy, more balanced. Uh, and as as Mr. Fair mentioned, that uh, the third party has more space. That's very very encouraging. Yeah, I sell that view. Yeah, uh, the T TSU and uh, People's First Party also all have uh, their caucus in the LOI. And, but I, I think overall, um, our Taiwanese uh, social structure is rather, it, it reflects the structure, social structure is rather uh, stable. Um, the north and south and the central uh, uh, is, uh, you know, the, the uh, KMD is dominating the north part of Taiwan and DBB on, on south and uh, in the central is, uh, is for everybody. Uh, so th this structure, is, uh, uh, it seems very difficult to, to move around. And the, the, the percentage of DBP and KMT uh, in terms of uh, percentage, I think uh, it's, it's about 45 to 55, and 40 to uh, 50. The same, you know, the DBP and KMT's uh, strength is very, com 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 very competitive. Yeah. That means Taiwan's uh, is middle class society is uh, now easy to make a drastic change. Uh, they, they always come uh, come back to the balance. Mm. Talking about this, uh, the many uh, most sens sensitive issue is about 22 consensus. 22 consensus is a kind of I don't know is a man mantra or uh, 92 consensus. 92 consensus, okay. Um, uh, some people said this uh, election results is a reflection, is a, a fermentation of uh, the, the, the mandate of the, uh, is a kind of uh, uh, refer referendum of 92 percent, 92 consensus. But I think uh, if, if there's a, there's a mandate, it's a reduced mandate. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, that's uh, maybe uh, is overreach. Uh, uh, people vote for stability, not necessarily vote for 92 consensus. Uh, consensus is a, is, a, is a secret code. It's a kind of prayer before breakfast. Uh, somebody <laughs> said, you have to pray, pray before you eat. Uh, but TVV said, no, I just want to eat. I want, don't want to pray. And, uh, it's, uh, and it's already 20 years, uh, 92 until now is 20 years. The first born uh, 20 years ago is now the first vo uh, vo uh, vo voter. They don't know uh, what that mean, the t uh, 92 consensus. And uh, according to the opinion poll, uh, more than 70% of people don't understand what's, what that means. 92 what? For what? 
Nobody know. But don't care. It doesn't matter. 92 is 92, okay? Just a prayer. We, we don't need to go into the, the, the contents. This election also showed this uh, uh, generational uh, succession. Uh, people, the old men like Li Denghui and Li Yuanzhe, and it, I, I think the, this is the last, their last chance to, to, to speech, uh, to, make us, uh, to support the DPP in public. Uh, a lot of people in DPP uh, is very moved by uh, Li Denghui and also by Li Yuanzhe. They are sincerely uh, believe that Taiwan will in the turning point. But I think the most of general uh, young people don't care about, they don't, they, they don't think this way. They don't think Taiwan is uh, in, a, in a crossroad. So in a, in a DB, and Li Dianzhe and Li uh, Dengwei uh, show up in the ready, have a kind of, uh, can be a backfire, you know, that it make the, the KMT very nervous. Uh, it didn't get much fall from, from the, uh, no help for uh, medium, uh, uh, for uh, uh, middle uh, voters. And especially the uh, Chen Sui Bian, I think that this, um, uh, the, the fact that he, he plays some uh, politics in the hero and that uh, his, his son uh, in the election make a lot of people very uh, nervous. And, and then the, the tape from DVP is, uh, uh, is uh, I mean, they do turn the bed, you know. From, from then on, from now on, DVP is, uh, is uh, don't care about Chen Sui Bian. I think uh, uh, most of people uh, are fed up with that kind of uh, uh, up uh, 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 the shadow. Yeah. So uh, I think the DPP is uh, uh, get out of the shadow of uh, Chen Sui Bian this time. And um, here I have to say some, something about uh, uh, Tsai Ing-wen because uh, most of, maybe many people don't understand, uh, don't know her enough, including me, but uh, I have some uh, <laughs> traditional, I mean, I have some, I work with, with her for some uh, some times, and uh, I have personal observations. I think uh, Tsai is very, very uh, an, uh, traditional politician, is very different from traditional DPP, he, her background, her education, her lifestyle, or, or, uh, he, she is very different from, uh, he is very new uh, for DPP, and DPP is very curious about, about her too. And, uh, but she has uh, that kind of charm that uh, a lot of people cannot resist. As a, as a woman, uh, lady uh, a candidate a politician, she, she is, uh, looks so innocent, maybe disguised, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and no ambition. And, and she play a very, uh, very quiet, uh, charming, to disarm everybody. So all this uh, faction leader uh, was disarmed by her. That she, uh, he began, he became as a reluctant politician, then it a, is a, seems a, a strong sense of uh, a mission. And she, she's very soft-spoken and logic and rational in private. And, and uh, when you people talk to him, talk to her, I mean, uh, especially this, uh, she has special uh, appearing to intellectual, to middle class, to young people, to women, and to high tech people. Uh, and she is very appealed to the professional. Um, I, I think if she got elected, she will, it's maybe it's, it's too late to say that, but uh, she, she will uh, recruit a lot of uh, a professional technocrat in her uh, government. Uh, because uh, maybe many people here, including Alexander Huang, have worked with her and you know her personality, and her, he, she have a lot of, of uh, friends in the middle class, I mean, in the professional field. And, and I, have, I have confidence if she have the chance to run the government, she will run very careful, she very cool. He, she is more conservative don't, than most of people think, but very persistent. Uh, it's a, Negotiator, she is very careful. 
she always talk about security net. She's not a leader that always leading. She is a more defensive, mm. Pre preserve the status quo. I, I think uh, people should give her more confidence. But the, the fact that she's new to, in the party, she's by accident become the sure woman of the party, that she's reluctant to come up with her idea, in, afraid of uh, making somebody unhappy during the campaign. That's why she tried to be evasive. And as a, as a professional a lawyer, she's very, she's the one to put all her, her stake uh, in public. Uh, but DPP, as uh, everybody knows, that the, the time has changed so much. And, uh, and so I, I think so, uh, 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 if DPP had a second chance, that they will come out very differently in our uh, straight relations. And uh, they will confront, next time they will confront the, the 92 consensus. And, and uh, this time, the, the KMT also have some, uh, they try to reform the party. Now, now, now not necessarily by the party structure, but they try to, to come up with new, some new faces. I think we should give credit to Ma ying and also Jin Xiaodao for that. Uh, come a new face. They try to, to avoid, uh, no, no money uh, politics this time. I mean, the, the party didn't provide uh, uh, big fund, uh, big money for, for the candidates. I know that because my nephew ran on the uh, KMD's uh, candy, uh, uh, platform. So, so I, but in, in the end, I think uh, it, the, the uh, election is always a humbling pro process for the politicians. But it, this time uh, and every time, the democracy, I mean, the election is uh, consolidating our democracy in Taiwan. And, and democracy is working and is, is in action is, is marching this time. So and, uh, that I conclude my, my speech. Thank you. So I'm going to speak from down here so Professor Ju can work in his PowerPoint presentation. So our, our final panelist today is, is Professor uh, uh, Ju Yunhan. He's a distinguished research fellow of the, at the Institute of Political Science, Acad Academia Seneca, and professor of political science at National Taiwan University. He's also the president of the Zhang Jingwo Foundation. Um, received his PhD from, in political science from the University of Minnesota. He specializes in Chinese and East Asian politics, political economy, and democratization. Um, he's the author, co-author, editor of at least 13 books. Uh, his most recent book in 2008 was How East Asians View Democracy. Um, and I'm done, but I'm not sure if you want me to talk, yeah. more. <laughs> me to talk more about you so you can get more set up. That's my trick, you know, to, uh, try to get more of the advertisement, you know, before I uh, speak. Uh, nevertheless, you know, good morning. Uh, it's truly really a pleasure. Uh, to be here, thank you, uh, Bonnie and uh, Richard, you know, uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, uh, very important event, the very first event uh, within the Bellway, uh, analyzing uh, this uh, very important uh, election. Um, as the third speaker on the panel, uh, actually, I would uh, only, uh, you know, add a few footnotes uh, following two great speeches. Um, and I think I will actually just, uh, uh, you know, pick up uh, from where uh, Antonio uh, left off. I think before I really uh, get into the dynamic uh, of the election itself, uh, I would rather, uh, you know, offer my assessment about the quality of democracy as, as has been, you know, reviewed through this uh, campaign uh, process. Um, and we see many sign of maturing democracy uh, in this particular race. Uh, we know that this election uh, uh, is the fifth uh, popular election for the highest executive office on this island uh, since a uh, uh, popular election for the president was introduced in 1996. Um, and for the parliamentary election, this is the seventh uh, for the national uh, representative body uh, since 92. So in a way, uh, competitive uh, electoral election and power rotation uh, have become normalized. 
Um, and in a way, you might argue that the partisanship uh, also had become steadily more crystallized. Um, at the same time, I hasten to point out that um, um, you know, the road to democratic consolidation has not been a very smooth one. Uh, you know, we have traveled down some bumpy road uh, over the last decade. Uh, based on survey data, uh, you know, we can um, uh, witness that the citizen confidence in the democratic system has suffered quite a setback due to the protracted political gridlock. Uh, and the escalation of conflict over national identity between 2000 and 2008, but has been gradually restored uh, in the recent past. Uh, let me, um, you know, get your attention to the turnout rate itself. I think it actually, it's not just a number. I think there's a very important story behind this number. If you look at the trend, um, you know, for the, you know, four recent presidential elections, each time the turnout rate dropped about two to three, sometimes four point uh, percentage. Um, so if we compare with year 2000, you know, it's eight point, you know, drop, you know. And if you compare with the last election, 2008, it's almost two point uh, drop. I, I, I think, you know, this actually uh, as a way, you know, Taiwan democracy become more normalized, okay, more become, uh, uh, you know, a, a routine. But nevertheless, uh, this, you know, almost 75% of turnout rate suggests that the passion of the island's electorate remain quite high, uh, but no longer at a traumatic level. Um, and, and, and before the election, there have been a lot of predictions that this time the turnout rate will actually, uh, you know, be higher than the previous one. That's the prevailing view among the pundit. Uh, the pundit turned out to be wrong, okay? Um, and, you know, they, they, have, they have two good reasons. One, that the perceived uh, tightness, you know, there's going to be a very close, you know, race. So, you know, that usually will, uh, mobilize more people to come out. Uh, and also you have the synchronization of the parliamentary election and the presidential race, right? So that might reinforce each other, but it didn't happen this way. But at the same time, I still have to say that this turnout rate cannot be sustained over the long term. Um, you know, it, it, it requires still a lot of passion, uh, enthusiasm, you know, to have this kind of turnout. The reason why is that, you know, in Taiwan, we don't have the absentee ballot, okay? So there are a lot of people, for physical reason, institutional reason, they were not able to vote, no matter what, okay? We, at any point in time, we have about 6% of the population, believe it or not, they were hospitalized, okay? <laughs> Waiting for surgery, you know, for, you know, recovery, whatever. Okay, usually they don't come out of the vote. Uh, we have uh, active duty, you know, military officer who are stationed, you know, uh, in places far away from their home. And also we have a large number of uh, uh, people who, you know, live and working overseas. Uh, who, not all of them can come back, you know. Although this time, obviously, uh, many, many, you know, Taiwanese expatriate return from mainland China and also some of them from the, the west coast of the United States. But, most of them you know, wouldn't have the time and energy and money. Um, so if you take those you know, you know, uh, you know, people out of the picture, this 74.4 uh, turnout rate you know, can be translated into a de facto turnout rate more than 85. Okay, much higher than any other <laughs> uh, mature democracy that we know of, and higher than South Korea. Uh, by far, by far. But nevertheless, you know, it's just a slow trend, you know, meaning that uh, signs of over-mobilization have gradually dissipated. And the skill of mass rally, you know, although I, I would say still, you know, very emotional, very impressive, but if you compare with what has happened in the past, uh, uh, you know, uh, each time those rallies have drawn a steadily smaller crowd. Okay, so I think that's a healthy sign. Uh, and although, you know, this is a kind of passion, okay. Before the wedding, uh, the bride, you know, uh, managed to cast her ballot, you know, the, um, you know, something even more important, you know, right? Uh, than, than the, you know, her, her wedding ceremony. Anyway, um, 
and I think another unusual, um, uh, so that's why, you know, the, uh, 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 Antonio said, you know, uh, the, the page of history has have, have turned, in the sense that this is the first national election in recent memory where the Taiwan independent issue was not on the agenda, okay? Maybe it's still, you know, in, in the background, but not, you know, up front. Uh, the DPP held back its uh, frontal challenge to the legitimacy of the state structure um, or the ROC constitution, okay? Uh, no more tactical move to tie a, provo pro a, a provocative referendum to a presidential race. Remember what happened before that, okay? Um, and, and, and so, and the national identity issue is overtaken by the debate over the 1992 consensus. Uh, so I would argue that the politics of polarization had taken a milder and less divisive character. Uh, aspiration for Taiwan independence has been replaced among the green uh, constituency, the fear of being infiltrated and assimilated by China. Okay, uh, and th and that really you know is the key psychological uh, you know uh, factor you know uh, uh, drove them to the polling uh, station. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I don't think for the, the green camp voter, uh, for them it's no longer the case that, you know, it's the end of the world if Ma get reelected. You know, uh, they worry, but they are not desperate. Um, but I think Ma three no. Uh, no independence, no reunification, and no war. The, the open pledge, you know, help in part neutralize the anxiety uh, and hold off this potentially uh, explosive issue. Uh, I also, I think, you know, we should congratulate ourselves uh, as, you know, the, as uh, a new uh, young democracy. This is an election, uh, you know, with civility uh, in many important ways. Uh, mind you, mainland background, non-native status was never an issue, nor uh, was Taiwan's female or marital status. Uh, no major dispute. I wouldn't say non-dispute, but no major dispute over the fairness and freeness of the election. Uh, and, and Tony also mentioned that there are no more bizarre incidents, okay? Uh, dubious, shocking event uh, on the eve of election day. Uh, both can, uh, although both can still practice, you know, negative campaign, uh, just like in any other democracy nowadays, but it was conducted by and large within the limit of reason and popular tolerance. Uh, and in the end, the DPP, especially Lady Tsai, uh, gracefully and calmly accepted uh, the result. Um, I also think this election is an election you know, that carry uh, another important feature. You know, we do have some meaningful and substantive debate uh, over some important issue, uh, over the, the future direction of Taiwan. Um, so I think the election offers a meaningful choice. Uh, for the citizen. Um, I would uh, condense them you know, in, uh, onto three issues which define the presidential race. The first and foremost is cross trade relation. Uh, so mind you, you know, his more conciliatory approach was subject this time to a timely popular approval. Uh, the second issue is about the integrity, capability, experience of the leadership. And the third issue is related to the second, but I would think still separate, you know, conceptually separate from the second. It's about which party is more capable of addressing the economic challenge brought about the euro crisis in the short run and the growing social economic inequality uh, in the long run. Um, now then, I moved uh, to, uh, you know, the what account for the outcome. Uh, you know, Mars convincing wing uh, and Taiwan, you know, didn't, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, get uh, the kind of uh, majority support uh, the DPP had uh, hoped for. Um, I think it's actually uh, quite simple, you know, in hindsight. Uh, basically, Taiwan electorate found no reason to re replace an incumbent with a proven track record with someone with unknown quantity. Uh, so Tai, her leadership is still untested. Uh, and many people still have a lingering doubt about her uh, capability uh, in managing the cross trade relationship, but also the economy. Uh, the majority of voters, you know, 51.6%, uh, were not persuaded that they should unsee an incumbent president who had brought peace to a trade, earned the trust of major allies, especially the United States, uh, expand the island's international space, 
uh, managed the impact of global financial crisis relatively well and kept his promise of delivering clean politics. Um, so stability conscious middle class and business community especially want to stay on the course of cross-trade rapprochement and preserve the momentum of reinvigorating Taiwan's economic vitality. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the other side of the same token uh, is, you know, what explained uh, Thai's failure to expand DPP's electoral base. I, I was, nevertheless, I would argue that, you know, she, uh, she did, uh, you know, the, by and large, a quite effective campaign in many ways, okay? Uh, at least she, she, you know, helped the party restore its, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, you know, the kind of uh, electoral strength it used to enjoy. Um, but nevertheless, I would still argue that the DPP's cosmetic adjustment to its China policy uh, did not bode well at both fronts. It is too vague to convince the independent voter, and it's too timid to galvanize its traditional supporter. Um, and I, I have evidence to support this argument. The decision to place emphasis on the issue of social economic uh, equality or inequality did not give DPP a decisive competitive uh, advantage, as the KMT itself is inherited with the legacy of a casual party and, and also is known for its ideological uh, eclecticism. The DPP ticket, uh, although I, I agree that, you know, Thai, you know, is a, a very, you know, uh, uh, I think attractive uh, uh, candidate among especially the younger generation voter, but I would argue that the DPP ticket was not as strong as it can be. Uh, I would argue that Sudan Town plus Taiyin Wen will be a stronger ticket, okay, in comparison. Uh, and, 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 it, and it turned out that the Su Jia Quan, you know, Thai's uh, lonely mate, turned out to be a liability rather than an asset. Um, and, and also the DPP, um, I think their strategy, you know, uh, tried to prop up James Soames' uh, elect, uh, electability uh, turned out to be counterproductive, okay, because her, his, you know, the, um, uh, uh, you know, the uh, entrance into the race and also the fact that he still maintain a considerable, uh, you know, portion of public support well until toward the end of uh, campaign really, uh, you know, create this sense of crisis among the, uh, the, the Penn Brew uh, constituency. Um, but the, the reason why Jameson can have that momentum in the beginning uh, you know, uh, thanks a lot to the uh, the, the Green Can uh, mass media. Okay, they gave him, you know, you know, the interview after the interview, you know, things like that. Um, so basically, in the end, Tsai only recovered uh, the DPP's uh, electoral strength, okay, uh, the 40, 45, uh, and couldn't really move beyond uh, that, 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 that threshold. Um, and, and then, uh, uh, everyone has to answer this question, you know, why Ma's winning margin surpassed most people's expectation, right? In including myself, I always predict that, you know, he might, Ma might win the election by two, no more than three percent, you know, uh, percentage point. Um, and the answer lies in the question itself. Because most people believe it's going to be a very tight race. Uh, and that is, you know, the reason why, um, uh, you know, the many, many uh, uh, independent, you know, the you know, uh, stability conscious independent voter and also reluctant, lukewarm, pen brew voter, you know, eventually they were prompted, you know, to come out to vote. And also many more Taiwanese expectorate uh, has a return home. Uh, and some of James Soong's loyalists eventually, in the end, they decided to split their vote. So that's why the, the PFP got more, you know, more than 5% for the, uh, the party list, you know, uh, in terms of popular vote, but much less, you know, for himself. Um, and in addition, you know, this is the, the last point very important. Normally, if the, 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 the pro-green uh, constituency, they are truly, you know, enthusiastic and passionate enough, the turnout rate in the South would be higher you know, than the turnout in the North, but this time it's just the opposite, okay? The Taipei and Taoyuan and, you know, and Xinbei, they on average, they all have, you know, at least 1% or 2%, even 3% higher turnout rate than Kaohsiung or Tainan Si, okay? This is, you know, that's explained, you know, uh, what I just said, you know, this sense of crisis uh, among the uh, Penn Brew voter. 
Um, and, and, and another interesting, uh, you know, the question is why the election had appeared to be too close to call. Okay, <laughs> uh, what what really fumbled and puzzled the, all the experts, uh, uh, including myself, you know, Antonio, you know, uh, and people who get drunk, you know, right? No, you, you just mentioned. Uh, I think the first of all, you know, Ma initially looks kind of vulnerable, but. He entered the race, you know, with a 34 percent approval rate, and 53 percent people who disapprove his performance. But, however, among those 53, many of them are the pen brew and or deep brew voters. Okay, they blame, you know, him for 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 a variety of reasons. Obviously, very different from uh, the the the, uh, the green camp. And, and secondly, no reliable poll figure, you know, due to very high portion of respondents refusing to indicate their preference, even you know, up until the last day uh, of, the, uh, 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 of the campaign. Um, I think you know, there are many Pembro voters who are kind of really reluctant, you know, lukewarm, okay? So they, they refuse you know, to express you know, very overtly uh, they are going to uh, uh, vote for Ma, or they, they, they might come out to vote at all. Um, and also the prediction, uh, all the forecasts was influenced by an outdated, now I can say outdated, okay, uh, yes, okay, receive view, uh, which assumes that the poll tend to underestimate DPP candidate real electoral strength. So everyone say, oh God, even though I would say most of the poll, I, I actually, I, this one I want to uh, correct, you know, what Antonio has said. Except for the Liberty Time poll, most polls predict Ma, you know, will enjoy a 3% to 8% lead, okay? Um, but nobody believing that, you know, they have this assumption, okay? <laughs> so, you know, you, you have to do some waiting, okay? Um, anyway, uh, like I think it was also very difficult to predict, you know, exactly how much vote James Song might eventually get, you know, how many people will, you know, vote sincerely and how many people will vote strategically. Uh, and, and both camps wanted, you know, to sustain the public perception of the Thai race for different reasons. The DPP, okay, to sustain the morale, uh, to generate the, the bandwagon effect, okay. The, 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 the camp, you know, to play the crisis card, okay. Um, so that, they converge. Um, uh, what's, I know uh, I'm running out of time, but maybe uh, I would just go quickly. I think. What's the implication? I know, and I don't want to upstage the speaker uh, of the follow-up panel, but I just want to say a few words here. Uh, I think this election consolidated the political collision behind the KMT policy of cross-trade political consolidation and econ economic cooperation. Uh, and also, I think the center of political gravity has been shifted. The Dushuri independence agenda, including new constitution, new nation, UN membership, and self-determination, and so on and so forth, is overtaken by the more programmatic debate over how to maximize the gain and minimize the cost and risk that came with cross-trade economic integration and the larger process of economic globalization. Um, I, I also believe that you know, for the next four years, there will be less political ob obstacle to, to, uh, to cross-trade economic integration, um, I think the Ma will stay on the course, and also he will feel uh, quite confident. Uh, the KMT, although you know, have a reduced majority, but still a solid one, uh, 64 plus three independent. I think they will stick together. Um, and, 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 and also, uh, I also argue that you know, while many people argue that many low-hanging fruit, you know, I mean, in terms of cross-trade relationship, has been picked. But I believe there are many more left to be uh, picked uh, over the next uh, uh, four years. And also DPP will, I think, will revisit its food dragging strategy as Tsai ing himself herself openly pledged that her party will not turn back the clock if she gets elected. Um, and I think this time the two-party system has been uh, uh, you know, further consolidated. Um, and, you know, the, the TSU, uh, when you uh, look at the, uh, the district uh, election for the LOI, if you add that popular vote, and this time the, the, the TSU actually, they decide not to nominate any candidate in any district. So, so the, the DPP will be able to capture the entire potential electoral support among the constituency for the district uh, LOI uh, election. Uh, and I think the future fate of the minor party, I, I, I don't totally agree with my two previous speakers. I think 
uh, they are quite precarious. I don't think um, maybe the Green Party might have you know, a, a, you know, a, a better future, but the TSU and PFE, I don't think they will survive. Uh, the longevity of their charismatic founder. Okay, and this time the TSU get nine percent due to sympathy uh, to Li Denhui, and this could be the, his last time, you know, come out on the stage. Um, but lastly, I want to argue that the domestic political agenda will consume Mao's most political capital and energy during his second term. Okay, he need to overcome the resistance to economic openness, speed up the FTA negotiation with major trading partner and prepare Taiwan for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is for the medium to long term. Uh, and also, he needs to accelerate the restructuring economy to upgrade and diversify Taiwan's export. And, 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 and most importantly, uh, he has to find a way to cope with the worries and demographic trend uh, that Taiwan is will be wrestling with for the next decade. I stop right here. Thank you for attention. Yeah. Well, I, I hear a consensus emerging that stability is very important. I was trying to think of any lessons for the Amer upcoming American elections. Does Obama have to become the president of hope and change, become the president of stability? Is that the key? Um, we have time for questions now, about 15, 20, 15 minutes for questions. Um, what I'm going to ask, I, I'll uh, pick people. Uh, please make sure to identify yourself very clear, uh, uh, carefully. Um, also, don't do a presentation, perhaps, you know, do a question. Uh, make your questions very short because we want to get a lot of questions in. If you want to make your question to a specific member of the panel, uh, say which panel you want to do to, otherwise we'll open it to all of them to respond. We also have roaming mics, so don't ask your question until you get a mic in your hand. Um, okay, so we'll just go ahead now. Thank you very much. Uh, Jack Zhang from the uh, Eurasia Group. Uh, my question is about the future of partisanship in, in Taiwan. Uh, do the panelists see uh, the two major parties moving uh, towards an increasingly polarized uh, party platform going forward, as is uh, often the case in the two-party system, or do we believe that for the next election, uh, the parties will align increasingly to the center as we see in this election? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's a, um, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great question because one of the things we saw in the, um, uh, uh, particularly the latter period of the Chen shui era was a move towards polarization. Um, I th I'm pretty sure that uh, I think, um, in this campaign we have actually seen, mo seen movement towards the centre. The DPP's movement has not perhaps been as, uh, gone as far as it needed to to, um, um, to win election. I think a couple of, of us have, have alluded to that. Um, and I, um, my instinct um, is that uh, the DPP is going to continue to move towards the centre um, in this next phase, at least if it really wants to um, win re-election in 2016. And I think it should have a very, uh, very strong uh, chance, um, particularly facing a new KMT uh, candidate. Um, so overall, I, um, Presidential and also single member district electoral system does seem to be pushing Taiwan's parties uh, towards a um, moderate position. And the other thing we need to think about on, on, in terms of your question is that overall, uh, Taiwanese voters are very conservative. If you look at the uh, opinion uh, poll data on national identity, um, if you compare the, gen the kind of average voter to the to politicians, again, I think uh, you'll find that most Taiwanese voters are very moderate, and I think that has a very major constraining role on political elites in Taiwan. Questions? Eileen Lin from Formosa Association for Public Affairs. Um, many aspects of this election were focused on domestic issues such as jobs and environment. According to certain polls, many people are not happy with the unemployment rate as well as the skyrocket housing rate. So why do you think the Taiwanese people prefer stability over change? Also for Mr. Chu, you stated that the election result reaffirmed Taiwanese people think President Ma's um, close ties with China is a better option. Um, President Ma also has many other policies, not just the cross-strait one. So what specific evidence do you have 
to make such conclusion. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, well, first of all, um, on the one hand, um, yes, among the younger generation, uh, especially people who are just off college, uh, it's very difficult for them to find a decent job uh, in this uh, overall you know, economic environment. Um, although this is not an uh, issue, a problem unique to Taiwan, I think it's everywhere. Uh, so in relative terms, I would say the employment rate, um, you know, it's, it's not comfortable, but not uh, very serious. You know, it's 4.8 uh, uh, at the end of, uh, uh, of the, the last quarter. Uh, the data, you know, where, uh, when the data is available, the latest. Um, and, and also, I think that uh, the, the DPP, although, you know, uh, they are uh, in the opposition, so they can attack, you know, the mass administration on many, many, you know, uh, uh, aspects, including, uh, you know, the social economic inequality, you know, housing price, uh, the, you know, unemployment rate uh, for the younger generation. But I don't think they have the recipe uh, of panacea at all. Uh, and most people, uh, I think, the middle class and business community, they, they you know, actually they, they, they worry that they, if there's a major rupture in the cross relation, then the economy of Taiwan will suffer even more. Um, so I think, you know, that's why the stability is not just stability, uh, you know, versus unknown, it's not change, you know, it's uncertainty. Uh, and, and uncertainty, you know, uh, uh, in a negative sense. Uh, whether people worry about the closer tie uh, with China, obviously, yes, you know, uh, some people, a lot of people, you know, including um, a lot of people who uh, voted for, uh, for, for Tsai uh, Ing-wen. Um, but I think this is a challenge, this is a dilemma we all have to face. Uh, not uh, even the United States, you know, will be exempt from this dilemma. Uh, people will say, you know, United States owe too much <laughs> to Beijing in terms of, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, who owns the largest share of abroad of the U.S. Treasury bill. Every economy surrounding China now, you know, export, you know, uh, more to China than anywhere else, okay? And that trend will continue. Although you can argue that Taiwan obviously is uh, exceptional in the sense that you know, we have to wrestle with the security implication, right? So that's why we really uh, you know, count on uh, U U United support and security commitment under TRA. Uh, not only that, I think what Antonio had just described, I think another uh, very important um, uh, uh, defense, uh, uh, not in the traditional sense, uh, you know, that might protect uh, from any future course of, you know, uh, uh, campaign from Beijing, uh, it, you know, is how we might win over uh, the heart and goodwill among the opinion leader, among those, you know, emerging middle class in China, okay? If they regard Taiwan, on the one hand, it's not productive, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, it's a shining example of how democracy, you know, can be established in a culturally Chinese society. I think in and by itself, it will give, you know, the Chinese leader, you know, very little pretext, you know, to, uh, you know, to be uh, hostile, at least, you know, uh, overtly, you know, uh, toward Taiwan. So I would uh, argue that it's not, uh, 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 you know, not a small challenge, but, but something, you know, uh, we, we have to wrestle with, with, with wisdom, uh, and, 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 and support from, from our major ally. Um, could I also have a quick uh, response? I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because I think one of the things we have to be very careful about is, is oversimplifying Taiwanese elections just onto cross-strait relations. I think particularly in this kind of setting, I think voting behaviour is affected by a lot of domestic variables. And I think Taiwan was quite effective in using this kind of social justice appeal. And it's been one of the, the key um, dimensions to... Uh, the new DBP under, under Taiwan since uh, 2008. Um, but I think that if we, can, if we look at this kind of appeal comparatively, Chen Tribian was much more successful um, at actually offering some real solutions to social inequality, particularly using, using a kind of a social welfare appeal. Um, while in today's kind of economic 
uh, climate, uh, it's much harder to make those kind of uh, appeals. So I think uh, Thay has really struggled with solutions beyond that kind of uh, slogan. Um, oh, okay, that was my one point there. Uh, Doug Spellman from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, I wonder um, why does Taiwan not have an absentee ballot mechanism? <laughs> Is there any uh, uh, chance that this might change? And if it were to change, would it have much impact or not? Uh, well, uh, I think any one of us can. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think uh, there's little consensus between the two camps uh, over introducing Epstein, uh, absentee ballot and how uh, that system should be introduced and through what stages. Um, but, you know, um, for, for instance, that we have so many uh, Taiwanese expatriates living and working in mainland China. Okay, and people will say, well, you know, they live in an unfree society, right? Um, so, you know, how can you guarantee the secret ballot, you know, things like that. And, and also, um, at the same time, uh, you know, the, you have, uh, you know, people with dual citizenship, you know, living on the West Coast. So there's a lot of uh, complicated issue. Uh, in any sense, uh, I think the DPP uh, objects this, uh, you know, this uh, reform more vigorously uh, than the KMT. Uh, much more vigorously. Be, they really worry about the, you know, the, the, the army of Taiwanese expatriates, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, living, working uh, in mainland China. I don't think they, you know, they, 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 they will vote 100 percent for Ma. No, not at all. But maybe 65 versus 35. Okay, so that's the ratio, uh, you know, according to the conventional wisdom. Yeah. Gregory Ho from Radio Free Asia. The question is about after many failures, uh, which poll will be more believable and trustworthy? <laughs> and, you know, even even the underground gamblers who know more about the, the sentiment, the election, they lost money. So, <laughs> and even the future affairs exchange, they are predicting wrong this time. So, could you give us any insights at which poll we should trust from now on? <laughs> You're more of a polling expert. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, well, I, I, uh, okay, let me get to uh, your, your point that, you know, whether the, the bookmaker, uh, they have a better sense. <laughs> um, unfortunately not. Uh, you know, it depends on, you know, in the South, yes, there are some, you know, bookmaker, uh, they bet, you know, in Taiwan's favor. Okay, but in the central part and the northern part, you know, it's, it's the opposite. Okay, people who are kind of uh, influenced by their immediate surrounding, the atmosphere, okay. Um, so people in the end, they are not very quote unquote rational, okay. If people are really, you know, fully informed, rational actor, then we won't have a uh, uh, Lehman Brother crisis. <laughs> Um, now, getting back to the uh, poll, um, I think it, nowadays um, the internal poll, I believe, that the KMT have conducted turned out to be quite reliable, uh, you know, looking at hindsight. But nobody really entirely believing it. Uh, because my colleague, uh, Hong Yong-tai, you know, uh, he worked closely uh, with the KMT headquarters, and they uh, use uh, 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 more a uh, systematic way to do the stratified sampling um, and they enlarge the sample size, you know, to more than uh, 4,000. Um, um, so they can, you know, predict not just uh, the island wide, but also north, you know, the central and south and so on. Most media, you know, uh, I think the, the, the methodology they employ is, is flawed in many ways, okay. It cannot cover uh, who people who use mobile phone only. Uh, they cannot cover uh, overseas expatriate. Uh, and, and also they cannot overcome the fact that uh, a lot of people who simply refuse to review their preference. Uh, so they have to do a lot of uh, uh, educated guess. 
Okay. Um, so, uh, in this time, the future uh, market, you know, the misfire, you know, in a totally different direction. Um, so I'm sorry, I, you know, I don't have any <laughs> uh, good answer, you know, uh, to your question. Um, so, you know, there they are, they are limits, uh, you know, the, uh, how, how to, to what extent the poll, you know, can be reliable. But obviously, we, ha we have to say the margin this time is not big enough. If, you know, it's more enjoy like more than 10% lead, then, you know, the, it gives you some kind of uh, assurance, but not, but not this time, yeah. I mean, my one suggestion is um, look at previous uh, voting patterns. I think that's probably much more reliable than looking at um, quite biased media polling. Yeah, yes. Yeah. The woman in the middle one. Microphone? It's now on. It's now on. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, Betty Lin of the World Journal. Could the panelists address the timing issue? Because um, the election is only a few days before the Lunar New Year um, vacation. So a lot of uh, people, Southerners working in the North, they didn't bother to go back home and, and come back to work for a couple of days and then make another long trip. And do you think this is a, a one factor for people uh, not showing up uh, in the South? Thanks. Yes, I think there's an issue. So, uh, the DVP uh, complained about the timing because uh, it's a lunar, Chinese new, new Year, and it's difficult to come to go back to, to the south and come back to work. And then, uh, so that, and the students still in school. Oh, so, this is a, uh, but the weather also uh, play a role. It's clear weather. Uh, uh, un un until the close of the, the booth. The weather work favorable for KMD too. So all kinds of favor factors come together. We have like one more question maybe. Sorry, you had your hand up for a while. Well, thank you. Uh, Steve Kuo, I'm the senior advisor of TechWorks. Uh, my question is about the, uh, the point you make, uh, the new healthy balance. Uh, on one hand, which is encouraging sign, I agree. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, do we need to worry about the possibility that will uh, make the uh, political gridlock that we often see even worse uh, in the days to come? Thank you. Okay, uh, um, I think this, if, if we think about democracy as, as having checks and balances, then, then I think um, this new um, parliament is, 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 is very positive. I think the uh, overwhelming domination that the KMT had, I think, created a sense of alienation among uh, many uh, people in, in Taiwan in, in Ma's first term. Um, so I think it's going to take, it's going to be very hard for Ma to actually push his agenda. And actually, I, I slightly disagree with Professor Jules' comment that there'll be less obstacles for cross-strait development, because I think it's going to be, I think this will probably slow down uh, development in cross-strait relations with a smaller majority. Uh, and again, I think um, this is, um, is positive, because um, you need to have uh, checks and balances. That's, that's, that's a uh, democracy. And it's going to take, um, it's actually going to force uh, mind you, and the KMT regime to actually look for some consensus. Even though the KMT was quite critical of, of Tsai on the Taiwan consensus per se, um, some of uh, Ma's post-election comments show that I think he needs to reach out uh, to other groups in society, not just the DBP, but I think um, uh, the, um, in reach out to civil society. So I think that's very positive. Uh, I just want to add one point. Um, I think the DPP have to think uh, very deep, you know, the, um, about what kind of a role, uh, you know, they want to play um, uh, in the parliament. 
whether they want to uh, continue the food dragging strategy, which cut both ways for their future electoral fortune. Okay. If they are content to be the permanent minority, you know, I think they feel free to do that. If not, I think they have to revisit, you know, their, their strategy. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that, you know, if you look at the ECFA, uh, initially, you know, for DPP, it's like over my dead body. But in the end, they fully, you know, accept this uh, fait accompli. And, and not only that, you know, Tai Yuen on her campaign trail, he, she promised that, you know, the nothing will change, okay? Maybe, you know, if she get elected, she might want to slow down the process. Um, but I think we are, uh, you know, DPP too, you know, they now live uh, in a new, under a new reality. You know, no one can totally ignore uh, the larger trend, which, you know, which has been unfolded over the last decade. So finally, I just wanted to see if any of the panelists had any last words they wanted to say after all our discussion. Are we entering? Uh, I think the last election is a landslide victory for my enjoy in year 2008. That's unhealthy. Now it's back to normal. The, the rotation of power of political parties uh, will become a, a normal practice as a pattern. And if DPP can successfully overtake, I mean, uh, about the mainland policy, trade relations, then DPP have a much more chance to win back power than KMT. The key of the Taiwan relations is for DPP now and KMT. I think the Beijing know about this. And uh, sooner or later, DPP will get taken to power if they learn a lesson. Thank you. Well, if not that, I'd like to have you join me in thanking our panelists for a very enlightening session.